evening. Let me see if I can get this thing to work. Oh, great. Um, I've spent basically a lifetime out in the Channel Islands, beginning when I was five, sailing out there with my parents. I've spent a lot of time in third world countries doing uh, various types of marine biology research, practicing medicine, and uh, a lot of that time has been spent going to and from places in small planes, so I guess it was natural that uh, I would become interested in aviation over the years. But there was a big impetus uh, from this gentleman here, to whom I dedicate this uh, lecture. This is uh, Charles Roger Keeney, a small plane pilot who died at the age of 100 in 2011 and who flew until he was 98. He was a frequent visitor to the Channel Islands, as we'll discuss. And I guess it's emblematic of his career that his first pilot's license was signed by Orville Wright. And at his <laughs> memorial service, uh, pilots there included shuttle astronauts and pilots of the SR-71, the Lockheed Blackbird. So he truly encompassed aviation, was a wonderful mentor, friend, second father. I also owe an extraordinary debt of gratitude to these people. I've spent thousands of hours in small planes and fully realized that uh, Charlie McLaughlin of Aspen Helicopters and Mark Overman of Channel Islands Aviation, I don't think either of them are in the audience tonight. They, they both had things to do. Um, they're both incredible class acts. They were both extraordinarily generous uh, and extraordinarily gracious with their time and information as they have been in my dealings with them for almost 40 years. Seth Hammond, himself a helicopter pilot and the son of George Hammond who flew to San Miguel, was another wonderful source. Um, I'd also like to thank the two co-authors for the last technical paper I gave on this subject, Ian Williams, who is a wonderful representative of the Park Service at its very best and Marla Daly, a wonderful force of nature. I'd also like to thank my colleagues at Channel Islands National Park, who were wonderful to work with, and after all these years, at my age of 62, still remain my heroes. Channel Islands are absolutely wonderful. They've been described as America's Galapagos, and there's certainly no hyperbole in that. They kind of beam like jewels on the horizon from the mainland. Uh, for several thousand years, uh, there's been a connection between the mainland and the, the uh, islands, first with uh, seagoing to moles or canoes by the local Chumash, increasing in uh, sophistication to today's vessels. But in 1904, 1903, there was a total game changer with this. Oh my God, I'm sorry, we've got one of my medical slides of an emergency medicine doc, my apologies. <laughs> Um, with this, actually, in December of 1903, when the Wright brothers first took off in Kitty Hawk and uh, aeronaut aviation uh, had its uh, beginnings. Uh, in the early days, there was a, a lot of innovation. There was a lot of spread of aviation. I remember a cousin of my grandfather's uh, who worked at one of the estates near the old mission in Santa Barbara, commenting that in the old days, he used to take the family car down to be serviced by this real bright mechanic downtown Santa Barbara, some kid named Jack Northrup. Um, so people came from nowhere. This was an area that was rich in aviation. You had Northrop, you had the Lockheed brothers who started out in Santa Barbara. Um, and there are really three phases of aviation that's accrued since then with respect to the Channel Islands. The early pioneers, which are all pretty much pre-World War II, um, post-World War II aviation, the private aviation, and and more substantially, the illegal aviation that went on out there and the commercial aviation that took hold in the 60s. We'll be talking about all three of those. The uh, pioneers um, included the Lockheed brothers who worked in Santa Barbara, the first uh, landing on the Channel Islands by James Lofman, Earl Ovington, who was a real character, and George Hammond, who is remembered primarily for his flights to uh, San Miguel Island. Um, by 1912, the seaplanes were uh, being built in uh, multiple fashions very robustly. This is a photo in, taken in San Diego of one of the early Curtis seaplanes. Um, Curtis was active both on the East Coast and West Coast. Uh, Glenn Martin, another uh, pioneer aviator, was very active in Southern California and actually made the first channel crossing from the mainland to Catalina, from Newport to Catalina, actually, in 1912 also. 
The Lockheed Brothers in Santa Barbara started designing seaplanes in 1916. Um, this is a replica of one of their planes, a uh, modern replica that is flown. It's certainly very gossamer-like. I'm not sure that I would uh, entrust myself to it. But in 1917, they flew for the first time to Santa Cruz Island. Um, not landing, they just flew over the island, turned around, and came back. They covered uh, 58 miles in the incredibly fast time of 55 minutes. Um, Seaplanes very rapidly became more substantial. This is a 1919 Curtis seaplane. The chap who's the, sec oops, the second from right. Um, see if I can, which one works here. This is Earl Ovington, about whom we'll speak more in uh, a couple of minutes. Um, the first seaplane crossing of the Santa Barbara Channel with landing was in 1920. The crossing was from the mainland to Smuggler's Harbor. But the lack of great harbors, the lack of broad beaches on which to roll up a seaplane uh, quickly made it untenable, and seaplanes were never used to the extent that, uh, that they were in other parts of the world. Uh, one of the major drawbacks is this. Uh, this is an interesting photo taken in 1919. This man is carrying another man uh, out to a seaplane in the Dayton River in Ohio. Um, I would only say, all of Mel Brooks, it's good to be the king because the man being carried is actually Orville Wright. <laughs> but uh, you can see this would have limited utility out in the Channel Islands. It didn't work real well. Um, the first flight uh, landing um, was, as I mentioned, by James Loffman, who did so in February of 1923. He landed on both Anacap and Santa Cruz Island. Um, and then fairly rapidly faded from the history books after that, after setting a pioneering record. In the 1920s, Santa Barbara got an interesting character, uh, the character being Earl Ovington. Earl Ovington was born in, in 1879 and lived until 1936. He was born and raised on the East Coast, kind of metastasized out to California. I apologize for using medical terms. But uh, metastasized out to California circa 1920. He was an engineer, an entrepreneur, kind of a real estate huckster, and he was also the first airmail pilot in 1911. Interestingly, he flew the airmail over a target, launched the mail in a out of a bag at 500 feet. The bag hit the ground and, as you might imagine, exploded with mail going everywhere. Mail was gathered up and then uh, delivered by land the rest of the way, so so much for the first, uh, first airmail. Um, he, however, was very proud of his title of the first airmail deliverer. He did have a brief career, less than a decade, uh, carrying airmail on the, on the East Coast and uh, kind of promulgated it as a prominent part of his resume for the rest of his life. He, on moving to Santa Barbara, put up a private airstrip in the Samarkand area. At the time, it was not Santa Barbara's official airport. It was really the only airport of any major size. Uh, but the airport went away prior to his death in uh, 1936. Another picture of uh, Ovington, circa 1919. He did have a very strong interest in aviation and was the instructor for George Hammond, a prominent local aviator we'll talk about in a couple minutes. He first flew to the Channel Islands in 1928, um, landing uh, in April out there to be a little more coordinated and figure out which one advances the slides and which is the pointer. Um, and he drew this uh, bit of graffiti on the wall of the ranch house at Smugglers. Now, I don't know, Ann, but I was told a couple of weeks ago that during some renovation out there, this was covered up by plaster. No? OK. Glad that was an error. Um, he was very proud of his flights to the uh, Channel Islands. He flew primarily to Santa Cruz and Anacapa and he mailed things or stamped them on the islands and mailed them and considered himself the postmaster for the, uh, for the islands. This was mailed to Bob Brooks, who had the lease for San Miguel Island. Um, again, uh, this was mailed from Scorpion. The Garini family were great friends of his. And uh, this was addressed out there to, uh, to Ambrose Garini. Um, very much a self-promoter. He died relatively young in 1936 and faded from the scene. He was the first one to
fly to the Channel Islands with any regularity and uh, is largely remembered for having trained uh, George Hammond to fly. George Hammond had an estate in Montecito, Bonnie Mead. Um, he was an engineer who was a wonderful raconteur and an interesting character. In the early 30s, he started flying out to San Miguel Island. And interestingly, Roger Keeney, whose photo I first showed you up there, first flew to the Channel Islands in the mid-30s with George Hammond. Um, Hammond fulfilled a great role out on uh, San Miguel Island. I'm sure most of you, uh, being at the National Park Service here, are, are island people. San Miguel is certainly remote. The Lester family in the 1930s didn't lead the most social of existences, and Hammond filled a number of roles. This is uh, taken in the early 30s. This plane is a... Uh, is a Waco, it's uh, his hangar at his estate, Bonnie Mead. Um, in the 1930, late 1938, he actually got a Beechcraft stagger wing, which he then used for the rest of his flying out there. A number of his friends have them also. Very uh, reliable plane, again, the hangar at Bonnie Mead. Um, he really approached his flying systematically. He kept a logbook of all of his flights. He uh, created Hammond Field, the field uh, adjacent to the main ranch, not where the main landing field is today. Um, he paced it out, he uh, measured it, drew it, and it was encircled by boards. He made a similar diagram for the uh, dry lake bed on the west end at San Miguel and a system of hoisting flags whereby Herbert Lester could notify him if the uh, dry lake bed at San Miguel was too wet uh, and he wouldn't be able to get track. He'd be able to land but not get traction to take off. And of course uh, he posted uh, this sign regarding uh, Hammond Field. By all accounts, including those of his son who is also a wonderful individual, he was uh, a genuinely nice guy who was a wonderful raconteur and was of great assistance to the Lesters. He was not up uh, not above doing some difficult flying. This is another Waco, and this is Kyler Harbor. He actually landed on the beach down there, which is definitely not the easiest of uh, places to put a small plane. I'm sorry the lights are up a little bit. Probably makes these slides a little hard to see. Is there any way we can turn the lights down a little? Thanks. Um, he fulfilled a great social role out there. Um, you can see uh, he's got his mail pouch, which is extant to this day. There's a melon. These are the Lester uh, children. This is uh, Betsy. Um, he had a wonderful correspondence, which I've been privileged to, to see with uh, Herbert Lester and uh, also with the kids. Uh, a lot of these little drawings and uh, proclamations were created. Um, he made all kinds of interesting envelopes for the kids over the years. You can see him here presenting, a uh, again, a melon to, I don't know why the obsession with melons here, um, to Mrs. Lester. Again, this is, this is Betsy here, who I'm sure a lot of you know. Um, very, uh, very, very rakish, uh, interesting character. You can see the supplies here that he delivered. This is the uh, beach stagger wing. Um, brought a lot of friends out. It was a very popular thing to do. Again, that's how Roger Keeney first got out here. And uh, some of these older pilots, and Roger Keeney also, and you'll see some of his shots, took some absolutely wonderful photographs. Hammond left a legacy of some superb photographs of the ranch house and its outbuildings. And I did the photography for Julia Costello a few years ago when she delineated the extent of some of the ranch buildings on San Miguel. And a lot of these old photographs that Hammond took were utilized in the process. I mean, as they, they are, are just beautiful works of art in addition to being great reference points. Sadly, um, the era of World War II aviation on San Miguel and the rest of the Channel Islands was shut down with the advent of uh, World War II. Um, in 1941, Hammond was out of the area. Um, a friend of his, David Gray, who made a lot of flights out to San Miguel also, was deputized to, uh, to be sent out there but the coming of the war barred, uh, barred the continuation of private aviation and pretty much ended the pioneering era. 
San Miguel and, and Ovington's exploits on Santa Cruz and Anacapa weren't the uh, only ones. This is a 1930s picture uh, taken on Santa Rosa Island. Does anyone know who the lad on the right is? I wish Ed Smith were here. It's his father. That's E.K. as a young kid and his, his sister. So there were flights out to the other islands. Santa Rosa Island never had the extensive pseudo-organized flying that San Miguel did. Flights out to Santa Cruz were pretty haphazard. There was a landing strip at Christie on Santa Cruz as of 1930. There was no landing strip at the main ranch. That landing strip uh, near Valley Anchorage that is there today actually wasn't put in until 1962. So aviation served a social as well as uh, foodstuff uh, function on uh, San Miguel. Um, it didn't serve much of a, a function on any of the other northern Channel Islands. And this came to a screeching halt at World War II. Post-World War II aviation is a fascinating era. All of these islands were off limits. They were either privately owned or owned by the government, and no one allowed flying out there. There was a great deal of flying out there. There was very little documentation. There weren't a lot of uh, photographs taken. Um, much of this documentation comes from Roger Keeney, who uh, late in his life wrote down a number of chapters of his exploits and the exploits of others for me to go over. Uh, places where I've been able to fact check Roger Keeney, his facts were always borne out. He was very self-effacing. Um, he was quite old even when I first met him. There was no self-aggrandizement. He was kind of the uh, ideal historical source. But even though he'd flown out before World War II and started flying out after World War II, he wasn't the first. Sadly, no photographs exist. But actually, Boy Scouts, after World War II, they had all of these C-47s, which are DC-3s, that were surplus. And Boy Scouts used to fly out to the Channel Islands to go camping. Um, they flew out frequently to San Miguel. They flew out to the West End even before the oil company, Richfield Oil, put in a uh, landing strip in the 50s. Um, but sadly, I've never been able to find any firsthand accounts. I've never been able to find any photographs. I mean, this illicit aviation is, is one of those things that may well be lost in the midst. I'm just uh, initiating an effort to try and see if I can find any primary sources for this and some of the other illicit aviation before everyone involved dies off. Sadly, they're at that age. But the real character and the prime mover behind illicit aviation on the Northern Channel Islands was this man, Roger Keeney. Um, here shown with his Coke. I think the only thing he loved in life more than Coke was his wife and kids. Um, Roger was born in 1911 in Southern California. His first pilot's license came after six hours of flight when he was a teenager. As I mentioned, his first pilot's license was signed by Orville Wright. As self-effacing as this man was, he was one of the linchpins of small plane aviation and Southern California aviation. He worked on Wiley Post's planes and had a much better explanation for the crash of Wiley Post and Will Rogers than the traditional one, and actually has the math and the equations and the calculations to, to carry it out. He worked on Amelia Earhart's planes. He swapped planes with uh, Howard Hughes. He flew with Jack Northrup. He invented uh, multiple parts for small planes during the course of his career, essentially owned Torrance Airport briefly after World War II, and remembering the joy that he'd had on San Miguel, began flying out with his wife after World War II. His wife subsequently died in the uh, late 60s. He continued to fly out largely to uh, honor her memory and created a wonderful photographic uh, documentary record of his, his flights, a little bit of which I'll show you, which is interesting. As I mentioned, late in his life, he wrote down chapters and episodes uh, that occurred out there um, I have a copy of uh, every one. It'll ultimately be accessioned into the uh, Park Service repository. Uh, his greatest joy was flying out to San Miguel Island. He landed toward the eastern end of the island. I'll show maps with landing fields later in the lecture. Um, he flew a variety of planes, um, uh, largely Cessnas, and this was his primary landing strip in the Willow Canyon area.
He'd often fly out with other people. There'd be sometimes three or four planes out there on San Miguel or Santa Cruz. They pretty much stayed off Santa Rosa. The Vales weren't real happy about people landing out there. Um, but I'll talk about one great exploit on Santa Rosa later. They essentially wandered the entire island. I mean, it's interesting that the Navy's now looking for unexploded ordnance out there. I mean, it, it is appropriate, but I both think of Roger Keeney from the 40s until the 80s and Steve Junak and I, who have spent decades botanizing on San Miguel Island. Roger Keeney certainly walked every square inch of the island, and I think Steve Junak and I have too. We're still here to talk about it. Um, it's interesting, somebody was telling me the Navy warned that radio waves may detonate unexploded ordnance. And as you know, most of the foxes out there are radio collared. I've got this vision of a fox going up. When the Argentinians fought the British in the Falklands, uh, prior to departure, they mined much of the Falklands. The mines were largely plastic. They had just a couple of very small metal springs and not detectable by conventional mine detection techniques. So the farmers, being bright, uh, basically swept for mines by running their sheep back and forth across the fields. I've seen videos where you've got sheep running across the fields. You hear blammo, and here goes the sheep you know, 20 feet up into the air. But uh, I certainly hope that never happens on San Miguel. They explored every aspect of the island he's seen out here with his wife and another couple. He got a great deal of enjoyment out of that. Um, and they, they had wonderful picnics out there. They carried a lot of, a lot of things out there. They grilled a lot of steaks. Um, they had cherry pies and, of course, the ubiquitous Cokes. Uh, to the end of his life, if you wanted to talk to Roger Keeney when you went into his office, he had a Coke machine and you had to match quarters to see who bought the Cokes. And they often spent uh, overnight periods out there. They brought sleeping bags and, I mean, this was, this was a big deal. They did a lot, of, uh, a lot of collecting and a lot of uh, roaming around the island. They were, and I'll, I'll insert this here, they were sensitive about what they were doing. I mean, even the extent to which they're doing the things in the pictures that you see will probably leave most people somewhat aghast. But they did not roam the pinniped rookeries when there were juveniles there. They never startled the pinnipeds with rare exception they stayed away from the archaeological artifacts. I did talk to one cohort of Roger Keeney's who on his own may have vandalized Daisy Cave in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, but they were, they were fairly sensitive. Otherwise, they did not disturb any archaeological sites. They were fairly sensitive to what they were uh, doing out there. They found interesting things on the beach, rocket engine. And see, this is an old uh, anchor. I don't know where this was, uh, was shot or what the ship was. And glass floats. I actually have some of these glass floats that come from Japan. But uh, Roger was fanatic about finding glass floats. Found a lot of them, interestingly, at Simonton Cove. And on occasion, they were more than he could carry. So he very carefully, I mean, this was a man who flew, and I flew with him up until he was 98. He drove until he was 100, and he was as safe a driver as if he'd been 30. I mean, he paced it off and landed his plane and took off again, no problem. And he did that multiple times, but this in Simonton Cove. Again, you've got to be a pretty darn good pilot to be able to do this. Um, they did interact with some of the pinnipeds, but again, they, they never did so when there were juveniles out there. As far as I know, and Roger, at the end of his life, was pretty bluntly honest with me. Um, no pinnipeds were ever, were ever harmed. Um, they did get caught sporadically. This is a fish and game warden who cited them. The Navy wrote them a nasty letter. Um, the DA wrote them a last nasty letter and said he'd leave it to fish and game. But Roger had a fine collection of letters from fish and game, <laughs> Santa Barbara County DA, and on occasion, especially one that I'll, I'll mention shortly, uh, from admirals in the Navy, and he treasured those. This was this wonderful old raconteur who'd look at these letters and get a gleam in his eye. I think he enjoyed pissing them off. <laughs> um, which brings us to one of the more interesting episodes. I had heard over the years uh, two stories, that the ranch house on San Miguel burned in 1967 when a bunch of kids were out there and got carried away. I'd also heard that the Navy burned it uh, to keep kids and others from going out there. 
But it turned out that both sides were wrong. Serendipitously, uh, my brother got married in 1982 in uh, the Los Angeles area. The photographer at his wedding was a Torrance fire captain. At the end of the evening, he was three sheets to the wind and I was about two and a half. We started talking, we talked about diving, he started talking about the Channel Islands, and then he looked at me kind of strangely and said, when it became evident that I knew something about the Channel Islands, do you know how the ranch house burned down on San Miguel? Which point I pricked up my ears and instantly became very sober. He told me the story but had been given so much grief by the Navy, and there's, I've got great photo documentation here, that when I went down to his photography studio a couple days later and talked to him, he basically denied ever having met me, but did give me the name of Roger Keeney, who wasn't out there at the time, but who had a photographic record of it. The story goes like this. As I mentioned, Roger Keeney took a lot of his friends out there. Um, and at one point, a middle-aged couple overheard some of them talking about San Miguel and resolved to follow them out there the next time they had a chance. And on this particular day, Roger wasn't one of the crew that flew out there but there were four who flew out there, three of whom, fortunately, well actually didn't have much of an effect, were firemen, um, and they were followed by this middle-aged couple. Roger's friends were wily enough to know that if you wanted to be avoided by the Navy's radar at Point Magoo, you went behind Santa Rosa Island, you went down to Wave Top Height, and you hopped up just above the, the South Ridge on San Miguel and landed on Willow Canyon. This middle-aged couple didn't know that, they came in at 5,000 feet, uh, Roger's friends landed at Willow Canyon. The uh, um, other couple landed at what by now was the main ranch landing strip adjacent to the, uh, to the ranch house. The ranch house by this time had been extant for decades. Betsy told me that her father stored hundreds of old magazines in the uh, rafters. So this was just a piece of incredible tinder waiting for a spark. Well, this photo is what they sent out of Point Magoo. This is a Grumman SF-2 subtracker that the Navy sent out. Um, it flew low overhead. It's so slow moving, it actually had a broadcast system. It broadcast, get off the island, to both of them. The fireman at Willow Canyon, having a nice plot of sand to write in, uh, very nicely wrote F-U as a response. <laughs> and uh, the plane came back. And to actually have this documentation, is incredible. This is the plane coming back at what would be treetop height. And this is what it did. It dropped a magnesium flare, one at Willow Canyon and one at the main ranch. And keep in mind that uh, three out of these four are uh, firemen. Um, the, uh, nothing happened for a while. The firemen kind of sat there uh, looking at it. And then it started to burn. Even then, you can see one of the firemen with his foot up on this flare. They then ran to the plane, got extinguishers, and extinguished it. Sadly, the middle-aged couple never had that opportunity. The other flare went awry and went right through the roof of the ranch house. And this is the only picture of the ranch that was taken by the middle-aged couple, completely engulfed in, in flames. This is how the ranch burned on San Miguel. And I've had pushback from people who don't believe it, but this is, this is about as good documentary evidence as you're going to get of anything in this world. Um, Roger himself went out there two weeks later. He has landed at the main ranch landing strip and the light is too high for me to see it. But somewhere in here, here's the remnants of the uh, magnesium flare. And it looks like an absolute moonscape. This is the ranch house two weeks after the burning. The uh, pump house at the head of Night of Her Canyon was spared. These are, I mean, many of you have been out there. These are fascinating historical photographs. I mean, you don't see these views very often. And sadly, the Model A, which previously looked like this, uh, was trashed too. But this is, this is the burning of the ranch. And again, the other participants, Roger was old enough that he didn't care. And enough time had elapsed by the time I met him in the early 1980s. But the others were still so terrified 15 years after the fact that this Torrance fire captain refused basically to ever talk to me again about anything in the Channel Islands. And they were essentially all told that if any of them were ever caught out there again, they would be in jail so long their great-great-grandchildren would never hear of them. And uh, Roger didn't get one of these letters. This is another, uh, another one out there. Um, letters, uh, a bit of a nasty letter signed by a rear admiral in the U.S. Navy. They were also visited in person by uh, Navy personnel 
who emphasized more vigorously than the letters what would happen if they ever went out there again. Um, another episode that I, I wanted to cover briefly, uh, one of the four uh, who were out at the burning of the ranch in Willow Canyon, a chap named Fraunfelter, had some mechanical difficulty and crash landed on Santa Rosa Island. This crash landing, for those of you who know the island, is very close to China Camp. Fraunfelter called up Roger, who came out, landed, picked him up, uh, sized up what needed to be done, went back, and got the equipment. When he came back, and this is another interesting aspect of this illicit aviation, this is an island fox on Santa Rosa Island. This is not a Santa Rosa Island island fox. Roger worried that there weren't enough of these foxes, and he worried that they might get lonely. So he trapped a number of them on San Miguel, Santa Rosa, and Santa Cruz Island, and moved them to other islands. <laughs> this is a San Miguel Island uh, fox that has been fed and fattened for a few months being released on Santa Rosa Island. Paul Collins, one of my colleagues at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, is one of the foremost island fox biologists in the world. And at the time when I gathered this information, he was in the middle with a woman named Sarah George, who was then at the LA County Museum of Natural History, writing a seminal group of papers on the morphometrics and uh, genetics of island foxes. When I told Paul this, I thought I was going to have to call an ambulance. He looked about as close to having a stroke without having one as I've ever seen anybody. Fortunately, the numbers were uh, small enough that this was not, uh, not a big deal. But Roger brought out the equipment that he needed and went to work. He replaced all of the landing gear. He put the plane up on blocks. He replaced the propeller. Um, this is uh, a couple of his colleagues hauling some of the supplies in there. And it's Roger's plane, and uh, the plane was then uh, flown off uh, the island by the original pilot while Roger flew his own plane taking photos. The only contradiction I've ever caught Roger in in the uh, almost 30 years that I knew him, when he initially told me this story, and, and Roger again was not, at, you know, in his 80s and 90s, was not prone to exaggeration or self-aggrandizement. When he initially told me this story, he told me that as they flew off some of the cowhands, he'd put up fencing and, and a tarp around the plane. And I can't believe that at a place like China Camp, nobody saw him for three days. But he said they were seen as they were flying off the island. And he sweared, swore to me that a couple of the cowhands shot at him with rifles. He later didn't remember saying that and kind of equivocated. But it's, it's the only contradiction I ever heard from him. This is the same plane in the air. Trivial stories, but I mean, absolutely fascinating. When the Vale family found out about this, as you might imagine, they were somewhat apoplectic. Their relationship with Roger was a little uneasy to the end of Roger's uh, days. Um, Santa Barbara Island. I've actually been told it's not possible to land on Santa Barbara Island. It's only one uh, square mile. There is a slide that I've got from just after World War II, or a slide I've seen. I don't have a copy of it. Ralph Philbrick, a former director of the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, um, was part of a group that was in one of the old big Sikorskis that landed on Sutil Rock here with one wheel on either side of the ridge at one point, and they did some botanizing while being tied to the uh, plane. I wish I had that slide. It's truly impressive and also truly terrifying. I've been told by some that you can't land a plane on Santa Barbara Island. In truth, um, fish spotters landed there uh, not infrequently, uh, beginning in the 1960s when fish spotting became uh, current. And this is Roger and a friend on Santa Barbara Island. Yes, it is possible. Roger was an extraordinarily safe pilot. He said this was no big deal. It was an easy landing. Um, he always seemed to be where the action was. Those of you old enough to remember will recall that Santa Barbara Island had a real problem with rabbits. Um, knowing Roger, this probably ended up in the evening stew. <laughs> as gentle as he looks with it there. And again, I mean, these were substantial. Uh, they did a lot of cooking. They slept out. They, uh, they had, a, had a great time. Yeah. Um, he also took pictures, and I've, I've included just a, a couple of them here, but of, of times and places and things long gone. These are the burrows on San Miguel Island. Um, they were helping to eat the island into the ground. I'm sure some of you know the story, but you know, the plans for taking them off were going nowhere. So the initial park superintendent, whom I absolutely revere, Bill Ehorn, went out there on a boat with a rifle and took care of the problem. I was there at one of the symposia on the biology of the California Channel Islands where he told that story. It was met with uh, kind of half nods of uh, 
way to go that's appropriate and half uh, utter horror. But this is, this is a photo taken in the late 60s, early 70s of the burrows on San Miguel. This is one of the horse herds on uh, the Vale Ranch taken in the early 70s. This is the Chicksaw. I've got multiple pictures of this from Roger. One of Roger's friends, actually, who is now somewhere in Northern California, um, he's a little dodgy and he is probably the one that may have raided Daisy Cave, but he actually has the logbook of the Chickasaw. He climbed up onto it two days after the wreck. The logbook was on the bridge. He walked off with the logbook. It would be an interesting relic for the Maritime Museum or the park to have. But this is a little more advanced, but wonderful, wonderful photos along the way. And this is, it's pretty much inactive now, but this is the Fumarol China Harbor on Santa Cruz Island. Uh, just his, his photographic journeys. And he has had hundreds of slide carousels with these photos. He got a chance to observe the sheep operation on East Santa Cruz Island close up. They're just these wonderful photographs of historical import. And yes, I will accession them all into the Park Service's collection. Old generator on Santa Barbara Island. The old lighthouse on Santa Barbara Island that burned down. A lot of things burned in the park. Roger continued flying out there long after most of the illicit flying stopped. Um, as national monument status ramped up, um, certainly the Vales had a vigorous ranching operation throughout, and there wasn't much landing on Santa Rosa Island. Um, Santa Cruz Island had a vigorous ranching operation. There wasn't a lot of recreational flying out there, too. Again, the Boy Scouts camped out at the West End. Others landed at the West End. It was pretty much the only part of Santa Cruz Island that was visited illicitly with any regularity. Roger kind of outlasted uh, all of the others. He still flew sporadically out to Santa Cruz and San Miguel. Um, this photo was taken in the mid 80s on one of his last flights. Um, the woman in the photo here was Roger's girlfriend at the time. Roger was uh, pushing 90 and she was not quite 70. She too was a wonderful pilot and raconteur, but uh, I haven't been able to, to give a full flavor of, of what Roger saw and did out there, but there are wonderful exploits and, and wonderful documentation, which fortunately I, I have. Um, and all he's had is uh, his ubiquitous Coke. Um, others did fly. This is one, uh, this poster was created by one who flew out to Santa Rosa Island and got caught and part of his judicial punishment was to create a poster to warn others off of the island, which he cheerfully did in lieu of uh, a harsher sentence. But uh, again, most of the illicit recreational flying was done on San Miguel because it was a lot easier. Um, crashes. Uh, logo, for those of you who can't see it, is, say, hey, what's a mountain goat doing way up here in a cloud bank? Um, amazingly enough, uh, despite the proliferation of aviation, there weren't a huge number of accidents. For those of you interested, Marla, in one of her occasional publications, it may be the one about the uh, chapel on Santa Cruz, which would certainly be appropriate, where she lists all of the accidents on Santa Cruz. Um, there have been probably, there's a story that goes with this that's too long to tell. No one was uh, hurt in this accident. Um, but there were roughly on San Miguel, Santa Cruz, and Santa Rosa, roughly half a dozen deaths on each of the islands from the period of World War II into the, into the mid-70s. Um, probably the most prominent of those was an individual named Wally Bassett who started uh, flying to Santa Cruz Island out of uh, Santa Paula Airport in 1962. Um, and that effectively, unfortunately, killed not only Bassett, but uh, effectively ended his, uh, his flying service. He died in this, uh, the planes didn't hit each other. There were actually two plane crashes on the same day. Um, those of you who know the islands know that the weather can be absolutely miserable. Um, we, I spent a week out on Santa Rosa with Mark Senning, one of the great rangers who's here tonight um, at the end of June, and the wind never dropped below 50 miles an hour for three straight, straight days. And the fog was pretty much thick enough you could kind of barely see your hand at the end of your arm. 
hence the home of the blowing fog appellation for some of the northern Channel Islands. Um, while conditions can be fairly vicious, there's been a relative paucity of crashes uh, with recreational aviation, and certainly the two uh, main commercial aviators who have spent time in the islands, Charlie McLaughlin and Mark Oberman, both have an absolutely stellar track record. I'll talk more about them in just a minute. Um, Bassett Aviation, I mentioned, started in uh, 1962 out of Santa Paula. Valenti Aviation was a minor player. Channel Islands Aviation started in uh, 1976. There have been other sporadic helicopter services, Condor Helicopters, uh, PHI, Petroleum Helicopters International, have flown out there sporadically. Aspen Helicopters was started in the late 70s by Charlie McLaughlin, and commercial aviation has also included research and special use. We'll talk on uh, each of those. Um, before I do, I'm just going to mention some of the landing fields out there. There are four generally acknowledged landing fields on San Miguel. They don't, I've got to do this better, they're not going to show up well here. There's a landing field that was well diagrammed on the dry lake, one at the main ranch, one at Willow Canyon, which comes down here where Roger Keeney uh, landed. And there was another one somewhere over here where DC-3s landed. We've seen, Mark Oberman and I have seen tantalizing clues to it on maps from the early 60s. It was listed as being at 250 feet elevation. There was no spot on that part of the island, and Ian and Mark and I have looked over the years fairly vigorously. There's no spot that we can really reconcile where there could be a landing field at 250 foot uh, elevation. The uh, main ranch field is used today, the dry lake uh, somewhat, the field at Willow Creek, which was marked by 55 gallon oil drums. No one's quite sure who put them up or why, um, is certainly no longer used. This is the main, this is a Norman Islander, this is the main landing strip at San Miguel. This is the dry lake. Um, as I mentioned, <laughs> there was a flag raising system between Hammond and Herbert Lester uh, because there were times when the dry lake wasn't so dry. Or even if the, you didn't have a water level like this, it was so slick that you couldn't get traction to take off. Santa Rosa Island has a number of uh, landing strips. No one is quite sure exactly how many. Um, I actually didn't list the main one at uh, Betcher's. There was another one at Old Ranch Canyon. I don't know. Mark, do you know where that was? Mark has, uh, Mark has, Oberman has heard about it. Okay. There was one at Pocket Field. There was an unofficial one at China Camp that uh, the one Roger landed at. There was a horrendous one at the uh, Air Force Base at Johnson's Lee that I don't list here. And there may have been another couple of landing strips on the uh, northwest part of the island. Uh, Pocket Field, the main one, somewhere down here at uh, Old Ranch Canyon, um, China Camp, Air Force, and probably another couple up here. Um, even though there are a lot of gullies today, I wondered about the possibility of, of a landing strip near Phil Orr's camp at Arlington, Cabin, or Arlington, Arlington Canyon. I went through um, some of the records and talked to John Johnson. And as far as I've been able to find out, there was never anything at Orr's camp. He was always uh, trucked in by vehicle. Santa Cruz Island uh, has some fairly well delineated uh, landing strips. Um, the one at Christie has been in use since the 1930s. The one out here at uh, Fraser Point has been in use since after World War II. The one here, the main one adjacent to Valley Anchorage, actually didn't get put in until 1962. Early landings out there in the 1920s were both at Smugglers and Scorpion. Um, Santa Cruz was actually the last of the islands to really adopt aviation, and that was uh, more or less after World War II. Um, this is a Cessna 310 at uh, the main ranch landing strip on Santa Cruz. This is coming into uh, the landing strip at Christie. Despite the fact that it looks a little hairy, this is actually a fairly good strip. The uh, only problem with the landing strip at Christie is there's sometimes a fog bank that hangs offshore. Sometimes pilots will be reluctant to come in. I, remember one memorable time, it was just after horrendous rains, we were miserable out there, we were 
low on food and uh, somewhat irascible. And Bud, one of the old pilots for uh, Mark Overman, kept uh, coming in as if he were going to land and flying off. And we couldn't reach him. But various fairly nasty things were said via the uh, main uh, airfield in Camarillo. But good, good landing strip. Um, this is Mark Overman, the uh, owner of Channel Islands Aviation, who has been out there since 1976. Um, I don't know how many of you have flown with him or worked with him. I know Mark Senning certainly has a lot, and he and I have talked a lot about Mark. Mark is, as far as I'm concerned, one of the world's great people. I've flown with him for more than three decades for graciousness, generosity, can-do attitude. I mean, he has got me off the island in emergencies when I needed to get off and the weather was absolutely miserable, and he's done it uh, extraordinarily safely. Um, he is the official air concessionaire for Channel Islands National Park, um, and as far as I'm concerned, one of the world's great people. He's flown a, a bunch of planes out there over the years, including uh, Beechcraft and a lot of Cessnas. Um, these are three of the planes that he has used a lot. He still uses the Norman Islander. It's a short takeoff and landing plane and is the workhorse of his, uh, um, his uh, group of planes today. Um, for a number of years, he used the uh, Cessna Skymaster, also known as the uh, Push Me Pull You. Um, it's used a lot by uh, California Fish and Game. The problem that Channel Islands Aviation had with it is the landing fields out here are, of course, all unpaved and fairly rough, and the landing here just doesn't stand up to a lot of wear and tear, and they ultimately abandon these planes. For a number of years, they used a twin-engine Cessna 310, too. Um, this is, again, their Norman Islander. Uh, uh, this is a Norman Trilander. It's actually a three-engine plane on the west end of uh, Santa Cruz. They used that briefly one of the more exotics. This is a classic. I mean, I, I love this photograph. These are the two workhorses, the Norman Islander and the Cessna Skymaster. Mark and his family, uh, taken probably 20 years ago at the barn at Christie Ranch. Um, most of Mark's flying uh, was to uh, Santa Cruz. Um, he also flew to Santa Rosa for the Vale family. He transported equipment, transported personnel, He's transported a lot of people to and from the uh, uh, field station on Santa Cruz Island. Uh, for a while, there was a um, uh, nature tourism operation run at the West End out of Christie Ranch by the Muse Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. Mark did all the flying for that. He flies natural history trips out to Santa Rosa, especially day trips. And at times before the Park Service had the full fleet of boats that it has today, um, and at times when the elephant seal population was expanding enough to make the island pretty well inaccessible by anything other than air during breeding season, Mark did a lot of, a lot of flying out to San Miguel Island. He's been one of the pillars of this park since its inception. Again, extraordinarily generous uh, with his time and uh, extraordinarily gracious in all of my dealings with him for over 30 years. It's the Norman Islander on the field at Camarillo. Uh, that's my gear out there at Christie. Uh, they were late picking me up that day, and I spent half the day sleeping in the barn. The other, this is a great photo of Charlie McLaughlin. The other commercial aviation enterprise that deals a lot with the Channel Islands is Charlie McLaughlin's um, Aspen Helicopters. Um, this is a Bell Long Ranger. He's got a Bell uh, Jet Ranger, a Bell 212 a two engine. He used to fly the old uh, Hueys. Um, Charlie is an incredible raconteur. Mark has trained, Mark Oberman has trained a lot of great pilots. Um, I worked for 10 years with the LA County Paramedic Air Squads. Um, a number of the pilots were trained by and had worked for Charlie. Charlie flew air support for the Navy. His helicopters were used as photographic uh, platforms when they tested some of their missile defense systems and some of their gun defense systems. Uh, he trained pilots in both the L.A. County Fire Department and L.A. County Sheriffs. Everybody knows Charlie. Everybody has a great Charlie story. Um, and uh, uh, he is, I've, I've never heard a bad word about him. He's much loved. 
A number of years ago when the Park Service built a museum out on Santa Barbara Island, they had the museum opening and Buster Hyder, a very elderly last survivor of the family that ranched out there in the 1920s, and a very elderly Cliff Smith, the Dean of Santa Barbara Botanist, who was quite elderly and somewhat infirm at that point, were helicoptered out there by Charlie. And on seeing the helicopter, Steve Junak of the Botanic Garden, Bill Dewey the photographer, and I approached Charlie and asked how much it would cost to rent his time in a helicopter. Uh, this was 15 years ago, and the time was something like 480 an hour. Well, none of us had gone out there thinking we were going to rent a helicopter, so we all pulled out our wallets and pulled our cash, and we had enough money for 12 minutes. So <laughs> Charlie said, fine, he'd do it. He very graciously took the uh, doors off his helicopter, went up at like 50 feet, 100 feet, 200 feet, 500 feet, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000, circled the island. We took photographs. And look at my watch, you know, 12 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. We were up almost 50 minutes. So I got the cash from all of the others, walked up to Charlie and said, Charlie, this is all we have right now. I promise we'll make it up before the week's out. Just kind of looked down his nose at me and turned around and walked away. He wouldn't take a dime for his time. And that, I mean, that's typical of, of Charlie. Mark, too, is a wonderful raconteur. He's got this wonderful story about the first time he flew Al Vale out there. And Mark was kind of a cocky young pilot at the time, knew he was good. They get out there to the main ranch landing strip, and Mark goes, uh, you know, Al, it might be a little bit easier to land if you fix that windsock there. Al looked at him and rumbled, son, if you can't figure out which way the wind's blowing, looking at the tail coming off a cow's backside, only I don't think he used the word backside, you got a problem. <laughs> Mark never suggested anything to Al again after that. Charlie uh, has flown less in terms of transportation. Charlie and his helicopters have flown a lot more research over the years. They did a lot of the helicopter flights that underpinned a lot of the environmental impact work that went into the islands before the National Park was created, um, some of which was offshore towing hydrophone arrays and doing surveys. Um, this is the helicopter at uh, China Camp on Santa Rosa. It was used for ingress into inaccessible areas um, sometimes not so inaccessible areas like the, the uh, beach at uh, Prisoners at Santa Cruz, um, but more inaccessible areas like this um, or out on Santa Barbara Island. Um, Charlie's really been the mainstay of helicopter work since the late 1970s. Occasionally other services are used. This is the new stairway for Anna Kappa, courtesy of Stacy, I believe. Um, Stacy is... Uh, Stacy's a little touchy about that. She furnished me that picture of Earl Ovington's graffiti out at Smugglers, and Marla Daly had never seen it. I shipped it off to Marla Daly when she sent me back some slides. That was one of them, only now it had copyright Santa Cruz Island Foundation on it. Um, thank you. I, I kept the, the fresh one. Anyway, this is the, uh, oops, the newer of the, uh, oh, the Pointers run amok, the slide advancer. This is the uh, new stairway on Anacapa being taken out by a sky crane. So occasionally there are other services involved. Sometimes uh, things are social. Um, this is a very young looking Ian Williams. And Seth Hammond, uh, recreation of the old George Hammond mail drops. Um, there is flight out there for medical reasons today. Please, sir, you're blocking the aisle. And a reader is reading, U.S. study finds uh, airline uh, medical aid deficient. Um, one of the things that we have to decide, I'm, I'm medical director of Channel Islands National Park, and on any reasonably sick or critically ill um, incident out there, we need to decide how soon do we need to get them off the island? Do we need to deploy a helicopter? So uh, it's largely Ventura County sheriffs. We give first option to Santa Barbara County sheriffs and uh, sometimes the Coast Guard flies out, but that's fortunately relatively infrequently. And there are other occasional visitors. 1991 marked the uh, centennial of the uh, chapel that was out on, built on uh, Santa Cruz Island in 1891. Um, the uh, gentleman who officiated at mass that year was Cardinal Roger Mahoney and before going out there, I'd never met a cardinal. And I went to my mom and I said, Mom, I'm not sure. Is it your grace, your eminence? And it's Roger. Um, anyway, Roger officiated at mass. And uh, Roger also turns out to be a helicopter pilot. He flew himself out there. Um, Fish and Game has a presence out there. I've long known their chief pilot, Jeff Veal, who is another wonderful character and a raconteur. 
This is Jeff in a typical pose with a uh, Cessna Skymaster. Um, he is another wonderful character who has done good things out on the Channel Islands. Um, along with John Suchil. Um, and there are various researchers. This researcher is a chap named Mike Sheehan. He's a former director of the Airport in the Sky at Catalina Island. He's flown research on uh, Santa Cruz Island. He's done a lot of stuff with radio tagging. He points here to a couple of his antennas. Um, but he's done some flying for environmental impact work uh, also. So the commercial aviation has largely been, from a helicopter standpoint, research work. Uh, the rest of the commercial aviation has been Mark Overman. It's been hauling people and, and supplies out there. And there have been some special uh, use conditions out there. A lot of the work that's done on Picacho Diablo, the high point on Santa Cruz Island, uh, materials brought in and out by helicopter. Um, I end where I started here with Roger Keeney, who for the uh, more than 30 years that I knew him was a wonderful source of inspiration, a wonderful raconteur, and who certainly uh, fostered my interest in the Channel Islands. And like so many of the characters who was, were out in these Channel Islands, was a larger than life figure who, despite being self-effacing, as so many of the people are, are still wonderful raconteurs and wonderful individuals. Um, with that, we pretty much come to the end. <laughs> Thank you very much for your forbearance. If you want to ask a question, uh, you might want to flag down Bill Faulkner, who's got a microphone. Oh, because we would like to capture your, your questions in this microphone. So if you could just uh, raise your hand in advance, and I'll walk over to anyone who has a question. Chuck, this, uh, I'm going to have to leave here pretty soon, but I, uh, I have a neighbor whose uh, husband was, flew, was a mechanic for the Marines in uh, Guadalcanal, then at uh, the airport in Santa Barbara. And she's talked to me, and he recently died, that he stayed until he retired in the capacity there at the airport with his own plane and whoever he worked for flying out to San Miguel often to help people who had landed that could not fly or were afraid they would get off the island again or maybe had their plane, whatever. I would love I, to talk uh, to her, yeah. Yeah, I, I'll talk to her tomorrow, but I, okay? Fantastic, yeah. thank you. All right, okay. Paul is one of the, not only volunteer of the year, he's one of the great uh, repositories of marine history in this region and fishing fleet history. He's written some great stuff about it. There's another question up here too, Bill, next. What year did you say that the house burned down on San 1967. Ago? 67. There's a, a coda to that. A couple of weeks later, there was an air show at Point Magoo, and Roger was at the air show grousing about the Navy burning down his uh, ranch house on his island. And one of the pilots got real surly and uh, turned away. And Roger apparently said, what the hell's wrong with him? One of the other pilots said, oh, he was the guy flying the sub tracker. He just had his orders cut for Vietnam. You, you gave short shrift to Money Aviation. They probably did more flying to Santa Cruz during the 60s and 70s than, than almost anybody else. Which, uh, which aviation? Valenti aviation. Valenti. They did, right, they did a lot of flying before Mark came up. Um, I need to go after information on there more. That's, uh, that's uh, one of the gaps in my records. Yeah, Jack did uh, all the flying for Stanton. Right. For, and for right. I should have I should have mentioned that, yeah. Uh, he flew in and out of the Christie Strip many times. Yeah, Christie Strip was in use actually since the 1930s. I was just curious about what the uh, the other uh, reason for the post Rogers crash was. I know what the reason that I read, but what you said there was a different. Oh, the Wiley Post uh, crash. Um, the plane was a hybrid, and the traditional explanation it was is that it was nose heavy. Roger didn't do the work, but was actually present when the gas tanks were reconfigured. They were flying north to Point Barrow, 
before getting to Point Barrow, they put down in a river near an Inuit encampment to make sure they were headed in the right direction. Knowing the capacity of the fuel tank and knowing where they had last landed and knowing the plane's fuel consumption, Roger was able to, to calculate the amount of fuel left in the tank. To take off a seaplane off from water, you have to have a fairly steep angle of takeoff to break the suction of the water. Wiley Post, for whatever reason, was known for particularly steep angles of takeoff. Roger had some photos and was able to approximate an average angle of takeoff. When the gas tanks were reconfigured, the gas outflow hoses were not flush with the bottom of the tank. They were a little up the tank. And Roger's calculations have it that the, there wasn't enough gas. It sloshed backwards, and the hoses were sucking air. The conventional explanation that they were nose heavy, um, his response was, hell, hybrids weren't uncommon. Even an average pilot could compensate for that. That's why Wiley Post, I mean, that's why Will Rogers was seated in the rear of the plane that Post would have been able to compensate for that. And it was the uh, being low on gas and the, and the hoses sucking air that killed him. And he, I mean, he had all the mathematical calculations out there. Any other questions? Uh, the, the backdrop, the island backdrop and stuff for Baba Black Sheep, the um, camp, you know, the TV series uh -huh. and all of that was, a lot of that appears to be the Channel Islands and maybe flown out of Santa Paula or something. Do you know anything about that? You know, I, I don't. I'm not sure exactly where they, they filmed that. Was it? I know William, William Conrad, who was Wild Wild West, had this very macho image. Um, they had to film some underwater scenes when I was a kid doing research work at Marineland, and they virtually had to throw him into the tank. I mean, he was, I'm told, kind of sniveling and uh, not extraordinarily happy about it, or so I'm told. The kind of bulky pilot in Baba Black Sheep was the son of Dan Blocker, the Bonanza star. And Pappy Boynton was the real goods. He was actually shot down late in World War II and was repatriated at the same time at the end of the war as an extraordinarily famous uh, submarine commander named Dick O'Kane, who commanded the Tang. And both of them didn't weigh a hell of a lot more than 70 pounds. Chuck, what are the chances of Smugglers International opening again? I actually didn't include it. I've got a great slide of Smugglers International. Chances are essentially slim and none. The other thing I gave short shrift to, again, you know, uh, fish spotting became uh, commonplace in the 1960s, and more on Santa Barbara Island than anywhere else, but a lot of planes landed just for a brief rest while fish spotting. Um, the brevity of their uh, incursion, even on islands like Santa Rosa, made it less likely they'd get caught. OK, here we go. Last qu question. Over to prisoners, there's an air, airplane debris field um, by Montano de Oro. Yeah. Can you tell me what that was? Um, actually, no, I, I can't. I don't know which, which of the crashes that was. I'm not, not conversant with that. Although, I, there might be, uh, yes. Um, Uh, that, may well be, there was a 1949 crash of a Vought, uh, west of Scorpion Ranch that is listed, uh, killing one pilot and leaving the wreckage on a barren ridge. Yeah. So Chuck, I was wondering if you can, this is a little more general, but, um, any more insight on Santa Rosa Island? Uh, you say they're, they were the least welcoming of flights, and also they were the not, they didn't want the National Park Service to have the park. And, you know, they, what was the difference between them and the rest that it was? Al, Al Vale was actually, I, first, I 
absolutely revered and continue to revere the Vale family. I mean, they were one of the great ranching families of the West, along with uh, their foreman, E.K. Smith, and his father and his son, who today works for the Park Service. Um, Al actually was a pilot who used to fly a Cessna 182 out there um, until he ultimately had his medical ticket pulled. Um, for a while, a uh, pilot named Sandy Braden, who is still a very controversial figure, flew him out. Sandy was uh, arrested for pot hunting out there um, and ultimately fined. He is a fascinating character who was the chief pilot for United Airlines for many years. And uh, I have done past work in the Antarctic and tend to cut Sandy a little more slack than most because Sandy used to fly and rescue people under circumstances nobody else would go out in. And he was uh, real goods. Um, the Vales were very private about the ranch when we used to have research groups from Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History going out to the Vale Ranch. They would scrutinize the manifest to be sure that everybody who was going out there actually had a role in the research and there were no, for want of a better word, freeloaders. Um, they were relatively private people who were very busy running a ranch and uh, simply didn't want trespassers or uh, intrusions. Um, same thing on, on Santa Cruz. I mean, Santa Cruz wasn't as aggressively unwelcoming, but there are wonderful stories. Uh, Kerry Stanton observed a boat that landed on one of the beaches, I think on the south side, and left some garbage. Um, and he walked back into, he walked into the boat owner's office after researching it and left a bag of garbage on, on his desk. Um, there's another story that, I mean, I, and I don't think either story is apocryphal. I can't verify them firsthand. It's another story that he made out the boat identification numbers of a family picnicking on one of the beaches on the south side. And he uh, drove up to their house in Santa Barbara, put out a uh, blanket on the lawn and started having a picnic. And when they rushed out, you know, angry, what the hell are you doing? His response was, well, you picnicked on my front lawn, I'm picnicking on yours. None of, none of the island owners, Santa Cruz, or San Miguel was always owned by the government and leased. A little bit of a different situation, and the Lesters in particular in the 20s and 30s were so isolated, they really welcomed visitors and were very gracious. Um, but Stanton and the Stanton family and um, the Vale family were busy running a ranch, and they were, I mean, they were very private and didn't really appreciate the intrusion. The Brothers Vale, uh, Mark Senning may want to add something to this, but as wonderful and gracious as I found them, they tolerated fools poorly. They were very busy and uh, they were very private. They valued their privacy. Well, thank you, Chuck. Again, thank you very much. Again.